It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Clark Howard Show, where our mission is to serve you and empower you so you make better financial decisions in your life. I hear from so many listeners who are worried about every aspect of the housing market right now. They're worried about buying a place right now, and then the market collapses. More and more articles I'm seeing about, is a housing bust coming, or a housing bust is coming. And I want to talk to you about that, about buying at a very, very hard time. And also, energy prices, it's been bad ugly with energy prices. I want to tell you how this is likely to all play out and what are the important things we've got to be about individually and as a country as we deal with these higher energy prices. So, speaking of high housing prices, the numbers are shocking how much home prices have gone up in the last couple of years. Actually, I shouldn't say the last couple of years. So, we hit a bottom in 2012, and home prices have been going up, up, and up, and more recently, they've gone really crazy. And this, as I've explained in the past, is not because of a failure of government, although we like to give government credit or blame for everything or, you know, the occupant of the White House or whatever. No, what happened with housing all goes back to the banking scandals that culminated in the Great Recession and the um, financial crisis worldwide that started basically in 2007 and accelerated in 2008. And so we ended up with way too few housing units being constructed for years and years and years, not enough builders in the marketplace, and it has been a problem with a shortage of every type of housing unit. You know, people who rent, You know, you can tell stories about what's happened with your rent and people trying to buy a home where everybody knows that the price of homes has gone crazy. So what do you do? Here you are sitting right now. Mortgage rates have roughly doubled. We're now looking at headline numbers above 5% for people with great credit on a mortgage. And by historical numbers, This is hard to get your arms around because we all think in the era that we came of age, 5% is like ridiculously low based on historical averages. I mean, I remember when mortgages went up to 20%. That was a long time ago. That's what happens when you've been out there a long time. And so when you look today at the 5% versus 2 point something, it is hideous. And it means that your effective cost of owning a home at today's prices is so much higher per month. Um, I'm seeing lots of stories about how first-time home buyers have thrown up their hands and given up, and they've left the market for now. And the decision about whether you leave the market today really should be based on your ownership cycle. If you can buy a home today that you feel in your life circumstance, you could be comfortable still owning that home in 2032, then there's a real uh, possible advantage to going ahead and buying. Because you lock in the price of the home and the mortgage is not locked in in this sense. Over time, we may go down again in rates. You know, the inflation we have that's charging ahead is not going to be with us forever, I guarantee. Every time a country experiences inflation, people start thinking this is their new forever. It's not. There are any of a number of tools that that we have at our disposal at the federal level that will help with inflation, plus also consumer behavior. The very fact that people are saying, you know what, 
this is not my time to buy a home. That in and of itself, enough individual decisions like that, it deals with the price spikes we've seen in housing. But we are not going to see any kind of wholesale collapse in housing prices like we had in the aftermath of the banking scandals. Because then we had a surplus of housing units in the United States. Today we still have a shortage of millions of units. So don't fret about that. Now one thing people are doing right now that puts me in complete terror is to deal with these much higher fixed rate mortgages people are taking out HELOCs or flow I'm sorry arms adjustable rate mortgages and ARM gives you a fixed rate for a period of time most often in the marketplace five years and in that five-year period you may even have preferential payments where you may only be serving the interest of the loan servicing the interest not any of the principal and then you hit a point in the 61st month where suddenly you're having to pay principal and the interest rates adjust typically once a year and it's too much risk at a time unless you know you're going to be a short ownership cycle owner you want to stay away from arms and besides with where prices are right now I don't want you to buy a home as a short ownership cycle buyer so in a very difficult market you do have the choice of staying on the sidelines and waiting for inventories to build and prices to moderate but again prices are not going to collapse or if you can afford the payment you don't want to pay it but you can afford it and you're willing to be an owner of that property for a long cycle then even if I'm wrong and we do have a softening of prices you'll ride through that over a period of a decade or longer so somebody buying something for a short cycle that's what I wouldn't do right now then the best thing be a renter and now it's time for Krista to step in and hit us with some questions that you posted for me at Clark.com. Yes, I've got a few related to what you just talked about. Jennifer in Texas says, I'm looking to buy a house and would be a first-time home buyer. I haven't been able to compete with all the cash offers coming in here in the Houston area. It's happening in a lot of places. Right. I saw a report on the rise of companies that will front you the money for an all-cash offer. What's the catch? So there are many different ways that this is being done one is where you pay a fee essentially for um, them to front you the money to buy the house there are others where you give up some amount of the future increase in value of the home as part of it um, there are any of a number of scenarios that come in this space all of them cost you money there is no free lunch here if somebody offers you the opportunity for you to compete with the typically Wall Street crowd that are doing these all cash offers or very wealthy people that are doing these all cash offers and so you have to look at that as an additional cost either at the beginning of the process or later when you would sell the property in the two most common ways there used to be pre the market being so overheated organizations that would work with builders who would allow you fronted money when you already owned a home where they would lend you the money essentially paying cash for the home some of the cost absorbed by builders and then when your home that you were trying to sell sold then you paid off that cash and took out a traditional mortgage but those are complicated too and not really applicable right now as strong as the new home sales market is so this is very very hard and I'm not necessarily going to encourage you to do one of these things to try to compete with the cash buyers I think the cycle of the economy slowing that we have going forward will be your friend in being able to buy a home 
and not worry as much about competing with the all-cash offers. Today, that's the story. As the Federal Reserve pulls enormous uh, liquidity, cash, money out of the economy, a lot of this kind of stuff will slow down, and you won't have to worry as much, my belief, you won't have to worry as much about competing with the all-cash buyers. This is from Michael in North Carolina. My wife and I have recently found out the state will be buying our house to make way for a highway project. Oh, man, your timing is great for that. I know you may not want to move, but this is great timing for that. With the housing market like it is right now, how can we be sure we'll get fair compensation and be able to afford a comparable house? Currently, similar houses in our area are going for way over asking price due to them being bid up so much and in some cases are only on the market for a few days. We're early in the process and are still awaiting our appraisal. Other than just finding another house or renting temporarily, what are some other options? For instance, would it make more sense to build new or maybe keep the existing house and have it moved to a new site? Thanks for all you, you and your staff do. So moving a house is not for the faint of heart. It's a really, really involved process and could be quicker and cheaper potentially than um, you having to start from scratch buying something else or building something. But let's go back a step. I want to go back to the offer that you're going to get from the state under what's known as eminent domain. They will lowball you, always. And you need to have your own appraiser come up with a competitive value market analysis for what your property is worth. Not a real estate agent. You need an actual professional appraiser because that's going to be really key to you getting fair value. If the stakes are large enough, if your house is worth enough money, you may consider hiring a lawyer who specializes in eminent domain cases and will advocate for you to make sure that you get fair value for your property because it is virtually automatic that your government will lowball you on the offer for your home to hold down the cost of the construction project they're doing and a lot of people say okay I'll just take it uh uh you want to do this right um, as far as uh, knowing what to do next about possibly moving your home, buying one, building, whatever. The only way you answer that is get out and see what's available, where you would like to live next, what it's going to cost you to buy a home, what it would cost you to buy raw land to put your home on, what it would cost to buy new construction versus existing in the area you'd like to move to. And then you've got to get quotes from a house mover what it would cost to actually move your house and remember it's not just that cost you got to make sure you've got utilities available where you'd be moving to foundation you've got, there's always foundation. I, did, you know, I did this you got to do <laughs> how much was it to build the foundation you had to build i don't remember how much the foundation was but i know it's not just you you move the house you need a foundation you need the utilities like you said you need to repair things that could have um come apart in the moving process it's not like a lot of times they have to actually put beams through your home and stuff like that so i saw that at your house yes. those beams and the people who did it were really good but they still caused damage yeah oh yeah in the process i don't think there's any way that not there's to. not going to be a need for a repair budget after moving a house as well this is from PJ. I'm a 36-year-old registered nurse with no debt other than student loans. My No husband, no kids, only a dog. Do I pay off the loans and then save again for a house or buy a house and make payments on my student loans? What impact will paying off the loans in, in, in their entirety have toward my credit score and home loan? So PJ, paying off the student loans will not necessarily affect your credit score at all. Um, it's paying on time that really matters. And the issue comes with the mortgage underwriter. If they feel you have excess debt levels, you may not underwrite for a mortgage. And that's where the balance you have on the student loans really becomes significant. They feel your ongoing monthly obligations are too high. Now, often, depending on the student loans you have, 
the student loans may carry a low enough interest rate that it's a disadvantage for you to rush to pay them off, particularly now that mortgage rates could be higher than many people's student loans. So paying as agreed would be more important. The other thing for you uh, mentioning your profession as an RN, a lot of uh, hospitals and facilities will offer as part of you working for them to pay off a certain amount of your student loan debt. And it's so hard to retain nurses right now, RNs, that more and more institutions offer with longevity as kind of like longevity bonuses, paying off student loans. So you may find that you don't even have to be the payer of those loans to get them paid off over time, at least a meaningful portion of them. So uh, good luck to you with qualifying. And if they tell you, if the mortgage underwriter tells you, nope, and you can go through pre-qualification and see if your ratios are uh, too high for you to be able to qualify for a mortgage, you'll know that. And that will tell you to ignore everything I said about a uh, facility or hospital paying off part of your student loans. That would become your priorities. You've just got to get those paid down, if not necessarily off. Now, if you've gone to the gas pump, a lot of people actually literally are borrowing money to pay for their gasoline. And all kinds of energy costs have been going up because of the war in Ukraine. I want to tell you strategies and what you need to know about where we're headed next with energy, kind of given a booster by the war in Ukraine. Seems like we've had a time of some really bad news on so many fronts during the war in Ukraine, the brutality of war and particularly the barbarian kind of behavior by the Russians, by Putin, it just tears at your heart. And I see this stuff and I just wish so badly that there was something I could do to help directly the people of Ukraine. I told you before about wanting to go there as a volunteer and there was really nothing that I had a useful skill to do in what's going on in Ukraine. And then Ukraine is affecting us and the wallet. And we see it directly at the gas pump. And we see it in other things going on in our lives. And uh, the suffering that we're getting in our wallets obviously is nothing compared to what's going on with uh, the brutal, brutal behavior of Putin. Evil. I mean, you wonder what the face of evil is. All you got to see is Vladimir Putin. I, that man just, as I've told you, bothered me forever. I always thought he was rotten to the core. And he turned out to be, sadly, exactly what I always thought he was. And look at the cost and loss of lives for so many people and dislocation for millions of refugees. So it seems trite and trivial to talk about how it's affecting our wallets. But that's a reality, too, of war. We are being affected. And when you go to fill up the tank, you're paying a, a $1 a gallon Putin tax, essentially. And so this is, this is hard because your vehicle has the fuel economy it has. And driving demand is what's called inelastic, meaning that people only can change so much of their driving behavior usually because most of us live in auto-dependent areas of the country. We've got uh, commuting potentially. We've got kids we're taking to sports events or to school or whatever. I mean, there's only so much we can do to make a difference in what that fuel costs us. And the money that's not going to fuel is a reduction in our spending power elsewhere. One of the crazy things why economics is the dismal science is the impact 
here in the United States is a big jumble. We are the world's largest energy producer. So it means that the higher prices right now for natural gas and us shipping liquefied natural gas to Europe to lessen their dependence on the Russians is something that's strategically very important in a time of war, but at the same time it boosts prices for us of energy that we use for our homes because natural gas now is the number one source of energy for power in the United States. And so many people in the United States use natural gas to heat their homes, not as important now as we move out of the cold weather season, but for cooking and other uses. And then we've got the higher price for gasoline. The overall impact on the U.S. economy, though, as much as it may hit those of us as consumers of energy, is actually virtually a net zero for the economy because so much more money is flowing to energy producers and ultimately indirectly to workers for those energy producers as the world's largest producer of energy. So it's a plus and minus thing that equals pretty much almost a zero effect or even potentially a positive effect on the overall economy. That's not much um, comfort to you if you're spending an extra 30 bucks when you go to fill up your vehicle, but it is a fact of the situation. And so over time, the vehicle fleet of the United States is obviously going to electrify. Uh, and that's not a solution for people today. You can't go out and say, okay, I'm done with this gas guzzler. I'm going to buy an electric vehicle because they're not available. But that's obviously where we're headed and our dependence on a single way of powering our vehicle fleet, our trucks, everything else, that's coming to an end. And so in terms of strategy dealing with Homeland Security, Technology is going to take care of that, and it's going to be a steady move through the 20s. But it doesn't help right now. You know, new report out that 10% of the world's energy now for homes and businesses and factories now comes from solar and wind. And that number obviously is going to keep going up because it's the cheapest forms of power we can produce now. And that same power can be part of fueling our vehicle fleets. In the meantime, we're going to need every source of energy there is to protect our homeland security, even more than our wallets. We're going to have to use potentially more dirty, stinking, rotten coal that pollutes the air so badly, causes so much asthma and all the rest. But we're going to need it to protect ourselves from people like Putin in the world who wish to do us harm, who are energy producers. I mean, we've got responsibilities here, but on the home energy front, that's where we can have the greatest impact because a kilowatt hour not needed is a kilowatt hour we don't have to pay for. And there's low hanging fruit at our homes in terms of reducing the amount of energy consumption we use in our homes. We can't do it instantly with the vehicles we drive, but we can do it with the homes we live in because our homes are desperately crying out for very low cost things that will reduce the energy consumption of our homes. And that involves proper insulation in the attic. An existing home, putting it on the walls is uh, often not easy to do. But if you're building a home, you wanna insulate like a maniac. But with an existing home, you can make sure you got adequate in the attic. You can put in an uh, intelligent thermostat, a smart thermostat, like a Nest that can save you about 25% on your heating and cooling costs. You can deal with the draftiness of most homes with the doors and windows, reducing the amount of energy and consumption you need. And you can be cheap like me and sweat a little more as it gets warmer by keeping the thermostat at 78 
except when it's time to sleep. So we do have some power. We do have some control. And over time, we will have much more power and control. Krista? Uh, yes, Clark. Mike in California wrote in and said, I've heard you give a lot of advice on saving money on heating and cooling costs, but I don't recall you mentioning whole house fans. In our area during the summer, the days are hot and the nights are cool. Would you recommend a whole house fan to cut down on AC usage during our cool summer nights? Okay. So the arguing about whole house fans has gone on forever. But you stated, Mike, the perfect situation for a whole house fan. If you live in an area where you live in California, this is true in a lot of the country, where the nights are significantly cooler than the temperature your house would normally be at after a hot day, yes, a whole house fan could potentially save you a significant amount of money on your cooling bills. And there's an initial cost to putting in a whole house fan. And there's a lot of arguing which company makes the most efficient ones. But that is a way where you've got that big variation in temperature day to night. You like, let's say most people like sleeping in a cool house. And so they'll tend to turn that thermostat down at bedtime. And you're burning a lot of energy doing that. The whole house fan is a way to recirculate air quickly, bring in that cooler outdoor air in just minutes and potentially lower over time, uh, not that much time, your energy bills for cooling during the hot weather season. This is from Catherine in Virginia. My family and I just moved back to the States after having served with the U.S. military in England for seven years. We've taken this move as an opportunity to get our financial life in order. While we're in good shape overall, we've put off a few things because it can be hard to get some things done while living overseas. I've appreciated your advice so much, but I have to say that everything you suggest does seem to be a little overwhelming. Can you please give me and other listeners who may be feeling the same way a cheat sheet of priorities, essential financial moves, then good ones to do when you finish the first list, and then a list of what would be good to do but not essential. I feel that all your advice is so important and everything you say needs to be done to promote a strong financial future, but it leaves me feeling overwhelmed like I'm drinking from a fire hose. Okay, well, Catherine, uh, number one, thank you for serving our nation in the U.S. military. I appreciate that very much, and welcome home. Uh, number two, you start with a simple thing, living on less than what you make by putting money since you're military, putting, throwing as much money as you possibly can in the TSP, the Thrift Savings Plan, the most efficient retirement plan offered in the United States. That would be top of my list is that you pull money out before you spend, you could spend it and you build up that long-term financial security in the TSP. That would be goal number one. Number two, as you establish new services in the United States, your monthlies, that's where you can have big impact. This is something I want people to do who are already set in their ways with who they use for this, that, and the other that are monthly bills. For you, this is where you can have strong impact right away. And that's where we can be of significant help to you at Clark.com because we have how-to guides on a lot of the monthlies that you can attack. Think of all the technology that people sign up for. And that can have meaningful impact. Um, and so start with those two things. And then over time, take the content you hear from me on the podcast that you read on Clark.com or see in our newsletters and use those things as step-by-step -step for you to attack everyday expenses or have a new way of doing something you may not have thought about before. And once again, thank you for your service to our great country. 
This is from John in North Carolina. I wanted to warn my fellow podcast listeners about the need to audit their Amazon digital charges. I recently discovered Amazon was charging me twice every month for the same digital subscription to the Stars channel. Apparently, it's possible to sign up through the Amazon Fire TV app and sign up through the Stars app. Presumably, we down- downloaded this to the Fire TV, but we honestly don't remember. I contacted Amazon. They claimed it's only gone on for three months and agreed to credit me for additional the additional charges. Needless to say, I'm going to go back through all my charges for the last 12 months and make sure there's no other funny business going on. Lesson learned. And I want to say, Clark, it's not just Amazon. We actually had this happen with ESPN+. Plus. My husband had uh, joined on a laptop, and then we joined through Roku, and then you get it through Amazon Prime. So, you know, it's easy to have this happen. Yeah, so this is a constant problem. Like um, T-Mobile is offering a discount right now on YouTube TV. And so there are people who've signed up through T-Mobile and they've also signed up maybe through Roku or Amazon or whatever. And so with multiple family members consuming digital content, you could have a family account with Pandora, not Pandora, with um, Spotify. And then somebody signs up for their own individual where you could have had much cheaper with the family and you're paying two different bills for it. So the key, and you brought it up yourself, is to actually look at your bills each month and make sure you're not dupe paying for something like you found, John. And the thing with Amazon saying, oh, we're going to give you the last three months, this is standard operating procedure in corporate America, is they'll say, well, I don't care how long you've been double paying, we'll give you back the last two months, so the last three months, and then we're going to abscond with all your money from before that time, even though you were paying twice for the same thing. That's why I know it takes a few minutes every month to do so, but going through your bills every month, your checking account, your credit card statements, in this case, your Amazon statement, this is really important stuff to do to protect your wallet. Krista? From Jerry in Colorado, we just got back from a stay in an Airbnb in Orlando. The resort was nice, but the condo was a disaster. When we arrived, we looked into the AC and furnace room to see it covered in black mold and a solid black furnace filter with a puddle on the floor that caused water damage to the unit below. Then we saw blood spots on the sheets. Ooh. The host only offered to refund the cleaning fee. I contacted Airbnb after our stay, and they said they couldn't do anything, and I was to report this immediately to them. There were other broken things in this unit. What recourse do I have to get a full refund? So, Jerry, I'm the keeper of bad, bearer of bad news. With Airbnb, as with any hotel chain, you don't complain after the fact. You complain immediately. And if you're very active on social media, be all over social media complaining. Um, if, if you're on a social, you can post pictures. You post pictures. You contact them. The multi-pronged strategy while the problem is going on, and particularly when you realize immediately when you go into a place, that's key. They have an old rule that came from the restaurant business, and that is if somebody complains about their food after they've eaten it, they call it eating the evidence. With hotels, with Airbnb, if you stay at the hotel or you stay at the Airbnb property and you just are unhappy and you had the problems and then you ask for money back, it's almost impossible to get that money back. Acting immediately and in every channel possible, and especially on social media, you post pictures of the blood on the sheets, you post pictures of that pool of uh, the black furnace filter, of the puddle of water causing the water damage, you post those things. Those pictures are so powerful, and you're going to find that people are monitoring, social media teams are monitoring and they will say, wait, 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 what can we do here? And I had a, uh, I had this happen with a friend recently who was staying at an Airbnb at the beach in Florida. And he calls me and he says, what am I going to do, Clark? I've got all these problems and we have this terrible gas smell. So the, actually the landlord of the Airbnb came over 
who was local, and said, oh, there's no gas problem. You're just smelling something. So I, I said, don't trust that. Call the gas company and have them come investigate. Sure enough, there was a gas leak. Wow. He got all the money back, and he was moved to another place. And the fact that they were in danger of being killed by a landlord who didn't care and would have had their own investment blow up was unconscionable. But I told him, in this case, the most important thing to do is get your family out of there. That it was too dangerous. And there are times you have to do that. In this case, he got another place and he got his money back because he was all over it as it was happening. Um, as to Airbnb doing a good job with complaints, it's a mixed record there. And the complaints can be from people that are just whining and nothing would ever be good enough for them. And so they get jaded after a while. It's your responsibility to make sure in the midst of it that they know this is a real thing and those pictures are powerful. And make sure you post a review on Airbnb so nobody else stays there. Stays at that place. Thank you. And that's it for this episode. If you have a chance, check out all the info we got for you at Clark.com. You want to save money in everyday purchases, you check out ClarkDeals.com. I want to tell you something funny about Clark Deals for a second. I have friends who moved to a new place and they have this wonderful, they're in a condo, they got this wonderful balcony and they had no furniture for it. And we had a deal on Clark deals and I forwarded it to them. And not only did they buy those, they're now like avid subscribers <laughs> of our Clark deals daily newsletter so they can get other deals like that. So we got our wonderful free newsletters. They're not there to waste your time. They're there to put money in your wallet at Clark.com to help you save money from coming out of your wallet at ClarkDeals.com.